right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we are so happy that you're here with us. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce Jennifer, my, our uh, co-host and, uh, oh, I put co-host, our co-lead for, uh, that was my fault, uh, co-lead for the environment sector, I'll fix that later. And then uh, Dr. H. Bruce Rinker, who will uh, be introduced more formally by Jennifer in just a little bit. But before, and welcome to uh, Dolores and Leslie and Elizabeth, thanks for being here. Um, I just want to run through a few uh, announcements, uh, upcoming events that the charter is going to be uh, hosting or a part of in some way. Uh, we are rounding out our 40 days of uh, peace uh, for MLK. Uh, today at 2 p.m., uh, Paul Chappelle, he's the founder of Peace Literacy, is going to be on. He wrote uh, a seven book series called Road to Peace. Tomorrow, um, Thomas Hubble will be on with us um, talking about collective trauma. And then on the 25th, uh, there's an LGBTQIA plus Pride and Power of the Song. Um, and then we have a couple of other more, a couple of other events. I'll put links in the chat room so that you can uh, find these um, once we get started. But let me just finish uh, talking about those. Then as soon as, basically, as soon as we're done with that, um, starting on March 20, uh, sorry, March 14th, we're gonna do uh, our ca compassion campaign for 2022, which is 22 days long. Um, and I'll, I'll put a link in for that. That will lead us right up into Golden Rule Day, which happens on April 5th. Uh, the Charter Education Institute is one of our like really strong arms of the charter here. And um, we've got some incredible courses. There's one going on uh, right now. We're right in the middle of it. Um, and then, but uh, just started yesterday, there's one called How to Realize the Power of Vulnerability and Open Your Heart to Joy. So if you're interested in that, it's not too late to register. It's a six week online course, only 50 bucks. Um, and then in March, we're, um, we're doing a, a, a course called Healing the Divide from Me to, to We Together. And then um, in April, there's a poetry uh, for inspiration and well-being course being taught. And then uh, we want to plug two courses specifically. And it's sort of like, I feel kind of funny about it because, you know, it's both both Jennifer's and my courses, but um, they have to do specifically to the environment. And so my course is Mindfully Reconnecting with the Natural World that happens starting the first week of June. And Jennifer's uh, starts the first week of September. It's called Compassionate Spiritual Ecology. Again, all those things will be, um, uh, I'll put some links in the chat room for you all to, to grab hold of. Um, we send out a newsletter to our partners every other month. Um, I'm not sure if you're getting our environment sector newsletter because you'd have to be a partner for, to, to automatically get those. But if you'd like to get those specifically, um, please let us know and we can add you to our email list. I think Jennifer is going to put our emails in the chat room right now. Um, that would be amazing. Um, We'd love to keep you up to date with what, what we're up to here and just specifically in the environment sector. And we do get some spots in the in the charter main newsletter as well. But um, all right, uh, I will, I'm gonna turn this over to my amazing co-lead, not co-host, but she kind of is my co-host too. Um, Jennifer, thank you. Thanks for leading us through today. I'll see everybody else back on the flip side. Thanks, Kate. Welcome, everybody. Kate, please check the chat. I only had time to type in what might be your um, email address for the charter. Maybe you can put mine in there. <laughs> I didn't want to be typing when I'm supposed to be hosting. Um, we are just thrilled to be offering this event. Um, as some of you may know, we alternate. So we run this terror event every other month, and we alternate um, books and movies. Uh, time by time. So we do about three movies a year and about three books a year. And we just started these events last year. So this might be our third or fourth one. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled today to have a guest, which we have not done at our other events. Um, let me just remind you that we're talking today about the life of Lynn Margulis. And the movie that we had featured is called Symbiotic Earth, How Lynn Margulis Rocked the Boat and started the scientific revolution. 
And what is so amazing about our guest speaker, Dr. H. Bruce Rinker, um, is that Bruce has intimate experience with uh, Dr. Margulis. And so we've asked him to touch on a few points and um, just to, to maybe help us understand some at a, at a really lay person's level, um, sort of what Lynn Margulis's really important scientific ideas were and are, um, and how that all relates to compassion. And then after Bruce has an opportunity to um, share some things with us, we'll move into a little bit more interactive time. We just have an hour today, so it's going to feel maybe like we're moving quickly through things. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to do a little reflective writing activity toward the end. So if you have paper and pen near you, that's fantastic. If you don't, you might want to grab it, but maybe not when Bruce is talking. <laughs> um, and so without further ado, I could give you a very, very long list of Bruce's accomplishments. I have to just confess right up front and be transparent with you and say that Bruce is one of my dearest, dearest friends. And I might weep if I try and go further into that. So I won't. Um, I've known Bruce for almost 25 years. We met um, one summer evening in Keene, New Hampshire, where we were both uh, beginning doctoral students in environmental studies. And I was immediately drawn to Bruce. And I remember saying silly things like, after meeting him, oh, I hope we'll have more opportunities to talk. <laughs> Bruce was like, yeah, I'm gonna see you in class tomorrow, like <laughs> every day for the next five years, four and a half years. So we have that kind of background, but Dr. Uh, Rinker is very, very accomplished. Um, he has done work in the Amazon and all over the world, most recently in Mexico. He is a scientist and an, an explorer and a researcher and um, a, a spiritual man and a human being extraordinaire. And if I can think of anybody who embodies the, the values and practices of compassionate environmental action in the world, it would be Dr. Winker. So I would love to just open the floor now to you, Bruce, and share with us what you will. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm so delighted to have your invitation to be a part of this group. And prior our, to our conversations, I, I knew nothing about it. And now it's just a beautiful, beautiful um, expression of compassion and the joy that people can bring to each other. It's just lovely. And Lynn Margulis was one of my most influential uh, uh, mentors, if you will. Uh, she was on my dissertation committee. She was also, I met her years ago and I liked her instantly, but I'd like to just share a couple of stories now, Jen, that sort of in my mind, it sums up Lynn Margulis. Um, the first story, <clears throat> she um, lived in Amherst, Massachusetts. And, uh, and she lived right next door to the home of Emily Dickinson. And it was, and one night I was at Lynn's home and it was a, it was a snowy night, cold night. And we walked around the um, the the property, and while she was chanting and and uh, reciting Emily Dickinson poetry, which was just a joy for her, and it was lovely. I couldn't believe it. How how, and there we were in the icy cold of New, of uh, Massachusetts, and right next door to Emily Dickinson's home. There we were. Another story I'd like to share is. Um, we followed each other um, through my through her latter days of her career, and we sh uh, she was very generous to uh, uh, to offer me authorship and and some of her some of her works. And the wonderful moment was we were at New College, Florida, and she had been an invited speaker there. And all of these young people showed up and they wanted, after her presentation, 
on um, uh, Gaia, and all of them wanted to enter, walk, they walked up to her and they chat, wanted to talk with her. And of course, it was an international group of people. So if Lynn detected a, um, a Spanish or German or French accent, she immediately switched into that language. She was so fluent in so many languages and she was a delightful person. Um, just to talk with them where they were from and tease out of them what uh, was important for them. So those are two little stories about Lynn Margulis and I miss her terribly. Um, we would communicate often and writing and, and, and uh, so forth. And it was, she was lovely, just lovely. Oh, and the, 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 the time that I was at her house, I did an overnight there and her son, Dorian Sagan was there as well. And then Lynn hosted my dissertation uh, defense party. And it was, <laughs> how lucky I am, was I? And when I heard the news that she had died, it was just so devastating. But um, gosh, if we can all make measure uh, our, our impact on others, just, it just, just a, a lovely woman, scientist, soul filled, um, interested in everything. And uh, you, there, were, there were times when I ran into uh, people who did not respect her because she was, she was on the edge of the scientific community. And, and I, the only thing I can do is attribute that to uh, gross jealousy for her successes. So those are just a few stories that I'd like to share. So a couple of things. One is um, for context for people who might not know, Lynn Margulis um, for a time was partnered with Carl Sagan. So the reference to Dorian is the son of Carl Sagan and um, Lynn Margulis. So that might give you a, a broader kind of notion of who Lynn was. Um, Bruce, would you, would you, um, and in the movie, actually, Dorian, there's a clip with Dorian, uh, or a number of times, actually, where Dorian comes in and talks about his mom. Um, Bruce, could you help us with a lay person's understanding of what Lynn's really, I mean, you mentioned she was on the edge of, of kind of the scientific world and her ideas were very groundbreaking, very revolutionary as the title of the film says. Can you help us understand sort of what the nuggets of that, of her contributions to science were? Yes. Um, and again, we're, we're lay people here, so. <laughs> it, it, it began with her microscope. And when she was looking into the world of microscopy and looking at cells, cells and organelles, those organelles, she discovered that each of them is carrying a genetic code. And, and that, that genetic code um, shared by the cell and all of the organelles. So she, um, when she made that discovery that all of the organelles are related into the cell and she, um, that, that, blew us all, all out of the, uh, out of the, uh, uh, just an incredible, uh, she and uh, James Lovelock as well. They co-authored the, um, the um, hypothesis uh, uh, and um, that all of these cells are related. It, it went beyond anything that Darwin had said. Now, I, you know my great love of, and respect for Charles Darwin, but um, what Lynn and James Lovelock did, it far exceeded, it pulled, it was a, a, it was a postulate that they could, this endo, endo symbiosis, um, it, was, it was a way to, you, to uh, propel the organism as a mechanism of evolution. 
And it was just, and all of us carrying in those cells, all of that, that genetic fabric, it was just lovely. I don't know if that helps or not. It, it does help. Can you, can you tell us something more about symbiosis? Because here we are, we're gathered, we're people who care about compassion and love and peace and interfaith relations and all of those things that sort of the charter for compassion holds. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here thinking about with my um, qualitative research, not um, quantitative research background. And I'm thinking about this notion of symbiosis and the interconnectedness of things. Can you tell us something both about the Gaia hypothesis a little bit more and also about symbiosis and how that, yes. what that means for us as humanity and humanity living on a living planet? One of the ways we can understand uh, uh, Gaia, uh, we can look at it as a kind of feedback system and uh, I'll use an example of my doctoral work. Um, I was in the forests of Puerto Rico, and I was looking at the connection between the upstairs in the forest and the downstairs in the forest. So the insect herbivory upstairs, and then downstairs, the decomposition decompo going on in the soil. And so we attempted, I attempted with colleagues all over the world, including Australia, and uh, even here in the United States, trying to connect all of that together. So it's a, it's Gaia is all about feedback, feedback loops, and the loop that we established, we discovered in Puerto Rico, North Carolina, and other places. That feedback loop is essential for the health of the forest. Hmm. So um, late af after I finished that, that, or was about to finish my work, um, I was involved, I was living in Florida at that time, and, and they, um, uh, a, a company invited uh, me and other colleagues to go into a, 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 um, an area that had been devastated by mining, and then they were trying to restore it. And they had some success, but not with the forest. They tried to grow back the forest and the forest was not doing well at first in one of the areas. And I asked them, where did you get the soil? And they, they, it was just fill. Well, what they left out, they didn't go to a forest that was healthy, a place where they could get healthy soil and all of the decomposers were gone. So of course the forest was going to fail. So you can't just put a plunk of a couple of trees and, and sand and, or dirt and wait for the forest to grow up to a, a canopy a, and restore the canopy. So that's, that's an example of feedback back loop. And um, I asked them, now you have to go and get tear out all of that soil and put some new soil in. It worked. Really? So the, the, it, of course it was that was we needed to give it a lot of time uh, to settle and but it seemed to be working. Now I'd, I'm anxious, I'd like to go back to Florida and go to those sites and see if they're doing well now. I don't know. But feedback back loops. And, and that's something that is unique to Lynn's contribution to the scientific world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Bruce, as, as beings, human beings, but beings, living beings on the planet who want to be compassionate, how, how does symbiosis teach us that? How does it reinforce this inclination we have to want to have peace in the world, to want to regard all beings with um, respect. The scientific community, ecologists, and, and including people like John Muir, they were all saying that we have to look at things in a different way. They are all, we are all interconnected, all of us. And that interconnection is the key to our survival. 
Can you say something else about that? How, how is that key to our survival? Well, like with the forests, uh, you, you leave out the decom decomposers, you leave out the herbivorous insects, and, and then the forest does not survive at all. So the same thing with all of us. Uh, we all have key roles that we can play in our, our own worlds. So finding our niche. The niche, right. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, that might be a, a passionate calling or a vocation, right? It might be service work. Um, but, but doing imagine, it from that. Can you imagine uh, Lynn Margulis looking into her microscopes and thinking about all of this interconnection? For most of us, we would be overwhelmed from the micro level to the macro level. And then across the planet. She was such a voluminous thinker and, and such a gentle soul, so approachable. Well, when, I first, when, I first, when I first met her, I was uh, just a kid and uh, I met her in New York State where I was living at the time. And I thought, ooh, this is Lynn Margulis. To, uh, how will I approach her? And I just walked up and it was as if we were old friends instantly. Mm. And that's the way she was throughout all of our communication. Well, and that really came through in this film. There were a lot, of, for those of you who haven't seen the film, there were lots of clips of Lynn at various stages in her life life and career, doing talks out in the natural world, or um, people who knew her intimately, family and friends, talking about her and her work. And it was very, we did get that sense that she was um, very open to talking about things. And what amazes me, two things about the, the film itself really amaze me. And if you haven't seen it, there's a link on the Charter for Compassion's oh, Environment Sector page um, that that can uh, get you at least to a trailer and a place where you can um, watch the film. Um, and if that link comes down off the site soon, because now to, after today, this event will be over, please just email Kate or myself at the charter and we're happy to provide that link to you to the film. But two things in the film really struck me. Um, one was just this anecdotal sense of who she was, who she was connected with, this very humble woman, they're doing clips of her and she's just sort of out in the field in her grubby clothes, talking and saying things like, now let's see, how can I say this so that we all understand and really trying to convey ideas in a, in a way that we all can understand regardless of our age or background or culture or ethnicity or any of that. Um, so I felt like she was really trying to level a playing field kind of. Um, also, she, the, this thing that you just said, Bruce, about she was looking into a microscope. So think about that, that stuff we can't see being made manifest through the optics of a microscope, but then being able to take that micro view and make it macro again um, with her ideas. That just, that blows my mind because I, you know, I can get into detail and look at something that way, or I can think kind of expansively, but to do it at once and to connect in that way, I think it's a, a true gift. One other funny thing I'll just say um, by way of story and anecdote is that Kate and I, my co-lead at the environment sector, watched this film together on Zoom. We, we streamed it through the, the share screen version or, or function of Zoom and watch the movie together. So there were various places where we were pausing or asking one another questions or making comments or whatever, or just being wowed by this experience. And at some point they're discussing how the bacteria on this part of my forearm is different from the bacteria up near my wrist, but that the bacteria down here near my elbow, the back of my elbow is more similar to the bacteria by case that area on Kate's body than it is to my own. And we got a kick out of that, especially because Kate and I live 2000 miles apart. <laughs> we're close as can be, but you know, we're geographically apart. And so to imagine those kinds of interconnections. And of course these 
United States. We're hearing things from uh, Suzanne Samard and all kinds of people about interspecies communications and things that are happening that can be scientifically proven. Though, of course, when we look at indigenous traditions, we see that people have been um, some people have been tuned in and aware of this kind of, uh, you know, interconnectedness that we all enjoy. Um, so enough from me. What I would love to do, it occurred to me that some of you um, might also have questions for Dr. Rinker. So I would love to move us kind of into a, a little bit of a discussion, but to start with Q&A. Um, Jennifer, any question? May, yeah. may I add one other? Um, Please. It's like a cautionary note for Please. all of us as scientists. Um, mm -hmm. Lynn, because she was so um, unique, such a unique thinker and worker, and mm -hmm. she would sometimes elicit or attract ugly thoughts. Uh, people, uh, they. I remember reading a review of one of her, one of her papers, and the view, reviewer said, "Don't ever submit anything to this paper, this or this organization again, because your the implication was that she was just too far out." Why do scientists do that to each other? We don't need to do that. And Lynn was exemplary she was she's not a goddess i'm not saying that but she was exemplary and a gentle soul and that okay. really came through that's come through your stories bruce and it's really come it came through in in the film really well too i mean just the sense that she was approachable um and of course she was on the edge and i think that that's something that that we humans um it's perhaps one of our generalized shortcomings, obviously not each one of you here on this call or maybe this way, but I think it's, it's really easy for us to um, hear a new idea, especially one that, that, that is really asks us to expand our, our ways of looking, seeing, et cetera, perceiving, and to kind of shun it or put it aside or diss it or whatever term you want to use because it's uncomfortable sometimes to be expanded it's uncomfortable sometimes to have awareness and light sh you know shined on something that we've seen in in kind of a perpetual way a habitual way so i i just am so grateful um that we have a bruce here today to help us um to kind of take these well, were pretty heady ideas, many of them in the film and places where I felt my own, even with an environmental background, right? Felt my own kind of eyes spinning um, at, at some of the details. I mean, it's the kind of film I, I would like to watch again and again and again, and just take bits at a time and maybe watch for five or 10 or 15 minutes and then go write in my journal and hike around in the forest near my house, right? And just really, find the examples in my local area of where these things are are happening and make those kinds of tangible connections. And I think Lynn Morgles made it really possible for us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's open it up. I invite you to, um, and, and for Mirabai and whoever else might have come in after the recording started, you can see in the upper box that this is being recorded. Um, but, but please don't be shy. You're, I invite you to turn on your cameras if you're comfy with that, to unmute yourselves and just jump in and maybe start if you have questions um, for Bruce or comments or um, yeah, whatever. Let's get a conversation going about compassion, about symbiosis, about our interconnections. Um, and if you don't have scientific language, that's great. And if you do, that's fine too. Just jump on in. And I just want to say, if it's easier, I can pause the recording if people would be more comfortable in this part to not have it recorded. I could pause it and start it back up when Dr. Rinker gets back on to answer it, you know. So just put in the chat if you if you'd like me to do that, I can do that. So 
So just a quick note about these Terra events. We did des design them to be interactive. We definitely want, um, we're trying to build community. We want to hear um, what you all are doing in, in the world and how you're, how you're connected or what questions you might have about these ideas. And maybe, I mean, maybe start by sharing an example of what you see is interconnection right outside your home. We all live someplace. Um, and, you know, whether you have a backyard or a shared green space or a local park, um, this stuff is happening everywhere. What do you see around you? What do you see as interconnection? Kate, you look like you're looking out the window. Do you want to start us off? I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> sure, I was I was just looking outside. I was like, you know, there's so many things happening, you know, just outside our windows. And, you know, my, we have a bunch of like cedar, like a hedgerow kind of a thing out there. And the the birds there just love being in there. And and my neighbor makes bird houses. And so they you know, as soon as one comes up, you can see like this territorial thing happening with no, that's going to be my new house or no, that's going to be my new <laughs> house. And, um, you know, so that they kind of just find their way into the new homes. And then the ones that, you know, uh, didn't win the, you know, the battle or whatever, they just, <laughs> they just live in the branches and they're just, you know, seem to seem to be just as happy, maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not in the winter, <laughs> it's a little cold, but um, it's, it's just it's just neat. And then how the trees just um, support support the birds, you know, and and I don't know, it's just, I just love watching that. And then I have this big um, shagbark hickory in my back of my yard and they've built a, a, the squirrels have built a huge nest up there. And so to watch, you know, the squirrels just jump from, you know, from the, from the shag bark to the birch tree and then from the birch tree over to the maple tree. And I don't know, it's just, it's just so much activity going on all the time. And those are, those are the ones that you can see right away. But then if you like zoom in, if you get in closer, you can even see more and more, right? Whether that's with binoculars or actually literally getting closer, you know, seeing the birds and their feathers and, you know, the textures of that, it's just, it's just fun. Sorry, I'm, I'm responding to um, a message in the chat. So I actually, um, sorry, not good at multitasking here. Um, I have two things I thought of. So one ab about the birds and, and the um, finding homes. We have a lot of nesting activity on this property where I live. And in fact, um, one year recently, I think there were 10 nests just on this immediate property. Some juncos, um, swallows, and they pick different areas. But one day there's a, my neighbor has a, a birdhouse right out in the center of the yard and it's perfect. I'm upstairs right now. I can look out onto the yard and I'm at eye level with this, this nest box. And I looked out and I have binoculars right here by the window because I can't help myself even when I'm working. I get very distracted by coyotes and um, the many kinds of woodpeckers and birds and other creatures that are in the yard. And I looked out and I thought, by golly, there's a, a violet green swallow and a junco, and they're both at this box. Who's going to get the special goodie of getting to build their nest in the box? And I swear I saw the junco go in with a mouthful of nest building material. It looked like it was going to be a lovely, luscious nest, and they like to make their nest very soft. That final layer that the the nestlings rest on is very, very soft, downy material, fur if they can find it. Um, and so I saw the jungle go in with a mouthful of food. So I thought, oh, great. Okay, it's going to be the jungle nest. I'll keep an eye out. And next thing, the next day, there's a swallow with a mouthful of nesting material going into the same box. And lo and behold, when it was fledging time, when the chicks came, I was out there with my binoculars looking. And in fact, the swallow got the nest, um, got the box for their nest. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I hadn't seen that before. The other day, though, I have to say, and this is a little bit 
far-fetched in terms of symbiosis, but as a spiritual ecologist, I do a lot of work, especially in the last few years in my own life and relations with non-human beings, but also in guiding others through connection with the natural world. And I, I was out in the forest hiking by myself um, over the weekend. And I went to this tree who has been really um, uh, a powerful force for me during this COVID time. And a tree I went to, especially in early COVID, and just kind of put my hands on this tree and talk to the tree. I misidentified the tree, I'm embarrassed to say, for the first few months. And then I, I realized one day, I was like, wow, I've been calling it this other name all along. And I know it's not that tree, it's this other kind of, anyway. So I've, I've properly identified this tree. It's a hemlock, a Western hemlock, which are one of the native species around here. And so sometimes I call the tree hemlock, sometimes I call him hem for short. I've done rituals at this tree, I've prayed at this tree. So the other day, it had been a while since I've been through the forest. I've been hiking other places and beaches on this island where I live. And I went into Hemlock and I'm just so happy to see you. I'm really excited. I haven't seen you for a long time. And I, I, I gave the tree a big hug. Yes, I do that. Gave the tree a big hug as I've been doing for the last few years. And then I remembered that I'm doing a class with a special kind of meditation called heart rhythm meditation. And it's led by a medical doctor and um, actually a woman who was my, my, um, on my committee, head of my uh, master's degree committee. And she's doing a research study in association with this kind of meditation. And the, the doctor last week when we met had talked about, so the idea is that this breathing um, if we breathe, inhale and exhale at the pace of our heartbeat, our own individual heartbeat, um, that this can do something with the vagal nerve and create greater health and well-being for our hearts. And so they're studying this and people like me get to take this class and um, kind of be the, the guinea pigs for this practice. So I decided he was talking about being breathed by the breath rather than thinking I'm taking an inhale and I'm doing this exhale. So I stood with my hands on this hemlock tree the other day and I closed my eyes and I began this meditation of breathing in and breathing out. And I, as I did that, I was thinking about this hemlock tree who is giving me that inhalation. And when I'm exhaling, I'm giving hemlock something back. And I went back and forth for several minutes of just holding on to the tree and doing a meditation and feeling that connection or trying to feel that connection. And it was a, it was very powerful to have an opportunity to um, take kind of a seemingly unrelated practice right out into the natural world and to be connected in that way. So I was also glad that there weren't a lot of people on the trail I don't know if people were passing me as I did this. Um, I was, I was had my eyes closed. I was meditating, so I don't know. Um, but you too can have an experience of actually connecting with a being and remembering our the source of our breath. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one that does that, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> So any questions for Dr. Rinker and or comments about this notion of, of interconnection, symbiosis? Um, Dr. Rinker, I'm curious. Um, do you have a, your own like personal practice that um, incorporates like this, this interconnected symbiosis thing? Um, that Lynn Margulis, you know, brought to our attention in, in, in a scientific way or just a, in a fun way. Um, do you do anything yourself on a regular basis? Yes, I do. Um, every morning I have a pretty lengthy meditation practice and, um, and in there I am deliberately thinking about uh, interconnections and how am I connected to something that happened yesterday, something about to happen today. And I'm, I am very comfortable with that. And I don't, I, uh, I encourage my colleagues in the sciences 
to also follow a meditation practice. And some of my greatest influencers, if you will, are uh, scientists themselves and are Buddhists. And I just, I, I learn from all, all of them and they're, they're very, I'm hum humbled by the, the, the honesty, the reaching out they, they, they generate toward me. So yes, I wish a lot of my colleagues, I, I wish all of my scientific colleagues could develop similar practice. Uh, it, that awareness, I try to carry with me even when I go outside or here even in the house. I thought of a question for you, Dr. Rinker. Would yes, you be willing to tell us about your latest book, which I've had the great pleasure of reading? Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, the one that just we just published? I mean the Pearl one. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Hold on. Here we go. That one. Yep. Can you say the title for us, for people who yes. can't see it, and uh -huh. then tell us what it is, uh -huh. please? The title is A Pearl in the Brain. And the subtitle is The Cancer Journey of a Scientist in His Search for the Seat of the Soul. Mm -hmm. And I tried to pull all of my life experience, or a lot of my life experience uh, together uh, in anecdotes and storytelling. And it, it's based on a horrific moment in my life. I'm still dealing with it. Uh, I have a glioblastoma, which is the same uh, fatal aggressive cancer that killed John McCain and Bo Biden. Unfortunately, the incidence of glioblastomas is increasing worldwide, and we don't know why. So I, I published my book, hoping that I can reach others and um, engage them in um, in this in the work the study and you know the last time i'm still going through uh treatments and and scans and the last time i was at the scan um, at U university of virginia there was a young man there who was you could tell he was just this this thing was unfolding in front of him and he um he was just lost. So I, I talk with him. Uh, he has a glioblastoma affixed to one of his auditory nerves. And, and so I've already had the surgery, the, the treatments, uh, the, uh, the chemical treatments and so forth. So I was, I was ha how happy to talk with him. And I gave my, um, my um, oncologist permission to unfold some of my medical records for this kid to, um, to help him in some fashion. So anyway, the book is available, hardback, softback, and uh, online. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for sharing some of your personal background as well with us today. And also, Kate has put the link for your the title and the link for your book in the chat box. Oh, oh thank you, Kate. Um, also, also, I I want to just mention what Dolores M. Dolores Rodriguez, um, who is here with us today, said in the chat box: "Everything is interconnected in my scientific and spiritual experience." Yeah. And I just love that. That is like the summative statement of what I think um, Dr. Rinker is is sharing with us today, and and what I feel wins. Lens work was, you know, the movie really talked about, you know, scientific revolution and, and from that through that lens of science, but I really felt Lynn's humanity in the film as well. I really felt her ability to connect with people and, and the stories that um, Bruce has shared with us today, I think really are indicative of that. Um, what I'd like to do is move us into a, a quick writing activity to help you get a little grounded in your own voice on a page. We're not gonna ask anyone to um, share what you wrote, but just to give folks, you know, some people are um, 
you know, good at, at talking and having conversations. Other people might be shy for various reasons or, or really can connect in deeply with something via writing as a writer. I, I'm that second way. Um, <laughs> so what I'd love to do is to give you a little opportunity to engage this material, whatever aspect of it. Maybe it's, um, you know, how you find your own self um, uh, connected with the natural world interconnected. So what I'm gonna ask you to do, and uh, just bear with me, I do this a lot when I'm working with clients and I like to offer them these kinds of settings too. What I would ask you to do is to get pen and paper. I would ask you if you're willing to actually turn your page landscape orientation. Sorry, Kate, you've heard this a million times. <laughs> Kate has come to my events and we're in some groups together. Please turn your page landscape orientation. Um, I won't go into the, the science um, of, of, of why I'm asking you to do that, but just to get your pen going. And I would ask you, once you start writing, let anything come. See if you can push your pen to move quickly across the page, avoid editing, crossing out, just let the words come. And sometimes when we give ourselves the freedom to bypass that, I've got to write correctly. I've got to spell this right. Oh, wait, I didn't quite mean that word. I meant this other word. We stop the flow and we cut ourselves off from an access to our deeper selves. So I'm asking you to suspend a little bit of disbelief here and just keep your pen moving. And, and the prompt I would give you, and I'll give you about, I don't know, four minutes, I'll say. And I'm never right on my time. Sometimes I say four minutes and I give you two or I give you 10, but I'll say four. Um, and what I would like for you to do is to just begin an engagement on your page, a free flow writing about how you feel or don't feel um, or, or and feel or don't feel connected with the natural world around you. In what ways do you feel really like, yeah, this earth is supporting me, I'm supporting the earth. And where do you feel maybe a little fractured from your relationships? around you. So when you're ready, please go. Um, maybe Kate, you could pause the recording before you start writing if you're going to engage this activity. I invite you to jump. I'm going to invite you to jump back in. And then Kate will decide when that jumping in time is over and will close us out. Um, I do want to again heartily thank Dr. Rinker for being with us. It's I'm I'm here with my friends, but you all are here with this um, incredible human being. And I encourage you to read Pearl in the Brain, by the way, A Pearl in the Brain. It's quite wonderful. And I wanna say quickly, sorry, before I turn it over, open it up and then turn it over to Kate, to say, Bruce, you mentioned Lynn Margulis more than once in this book, right? Yes, I do. Okay. I do. And um, yeah, it was, it was, that's, she was part of my search. So thank you, thank you, Jennifer. And I appreciate the, um, the, the honor of invitation to be part of your group. Mm -hmm. And now I have, a, I have a, a homework projects in front of me. I'm looking at all the, the, the messages that I've been getting and you have been getting. And I would like to invite any of your viewers to um, get in touch with me and I'd be happy to talk with them um, offline. Thank you, that's really generous, Bruce. And maybe you could um, tell me your email and I'll type it into the chat. Yes, box. okay, no caps, no spaces, mm -hmm. hbrucerinker at gmail.com. I got it. It's in the chat box. Kate, you want to facilitate the open-endedness and then close us out when you think it's time? Yes. Um, and Jennifer, uh, may I say again how, how honored I am by your invitation? Oh. And I just got a message from some friends that I need to, I'm going to have to leave the conversation. Okay. And, and if you do this again, I want to, I would, I'd like to be part of your Great. invitation list. Great, we will we'll add you to the invitation list. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thanks so much for being here. Good luck with everything else you have going on today. We will see you. Thank you. Excuse, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Rinker. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Bye. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, a couple of um, end of the program announcements. I'm so happy that we get to talk. Uh, we have a connection now with Dr. Rinker so that we can, uh, you know, ask him questions or just converse with him. So I, I, I'm sure that I can speak for all of us that it was generous of him to, to open himself up to us um, on a more personal level. So that's awesome. Um, I told you all about charter events at the beginning of this program, but I want to tell you more specifically about some environment sector events that are coming up. Um, we do have these uh, Terra book and discussion series uh, discussions every other month. And this was a different one because we had, you know, this really unique guest with us today. Um, so we didn't really talk as much with you about the book like we normally do. Um, but uh, thank you for being here. So our next event is in April on the 27th. And we're going to be discussing the encyclical, encyclical letter 